If you're catching the theme that I put in the morning, help is on the way. I, I wrote down from that very last sentence, no matter how bad things get, there's always hope for a different ending. I know you guys talked a little bit Wednesday night about Lazarus and Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And you watch as Martha struggles with that in that video. Where was Jesus when we needed him? Where, did he abandon us? Did he forget about us? Even though he healed Lazarus, almost that resentment that he didn't come on my time. And yet, then recognizing that as Jesus hung on the cross, he also faced that same abandonment. But there was hope for a different ending. It's been our series in First Peter, Hope in the Midst of Chaos. Like I said, I thought Toby's song tied in well to that. Help is on the way, maybe midnight or midday. The help is on the way. God never abandons us. He's always there, and there's always hope in a different ending. That's why we never stop caring for people. It's never why we stop, never stop praying for people. No matter how far they may seem gone, there's always hope. So I wanted to show that video to kind of tie in where we're at today. We're, we're going to be in John chapter 12. Mary anoints Jesus at Bethany. And again, just, just, real, real, just a snippet for those of you who kind of like history and like timelines. Historically, the church teaches that this is the weekend that Lazarus would have died and been raised from the dead. So either Saturday or, or probably not Saturday, most likely Sunday because Jesus did not heal Lazarus on the Sabbath that we know of. But essentially this weekend this is when that story happened. So it was very, very right before the triumphal entry. Um, it clearly caused a lot of issues. Um, I mean, from that point on, the, the Jews were determined to kill Jesus. Um, if, you, if you read John 11 at all recently, and John 11:54 says that Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to a region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim where he stayed with the disciples. So Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, caused a lot of conflict. Everyone's trying to kill him. He goes into the wilderness and spends these last few days, maybe a week, we don't know for sure, uh, with his disciples in a town near Ephraim. Which brings us to our story. It says, Now the Passover was at hand, in verse 55 of 11. And many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to pu purify themselves. And so in Jewish custom, you, had, you went to the Passover, if you could, um, usually, you know, once a year. Sometimes you went every other year, depending on your financial situation, what you could do. But you had to go to Jerusalem, right? So no matter where you lived, you had to leave and go to Jerusalem, which costs money. It's a journey. You've got to find a place to stay. Um, but you had to go early to purify yourself. In other words, you knew that you had sinned. You knew that you were wicked. You knew that you had done things wrong. So you had to go early to make right for all your sins so that you could participate in Passover and participate in the meal. So people would go up early and they would purify themselves. And it says they were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think? That he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anywhere, if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. So again, the city is like tension. Like there's this buzz in Jerusalem like it has never been before. I mean, everyone knows about Lazarus. Lazarus and his sisters lived in Bethany. Bethany was two miles outside of Jerusalem, okay? So it'd be considered what we call a suburb today. So anyone that anyone knew about this guy that was dead, been in the grave for four days, so he was dead, dead, and all of a sudden he came out of the grave and he was alive. I mean, everybody knew about it. You didn't need social media to know this story. Everybody knew the story of Lazarus. He was, they lived close enough to Bethlehem. Who knows? They might have even worked in Bethlehem. So the city was a buzz. And this guy, this guy Jesus loved, had been raised from the dead. And then Jesus disappeared. We don't know where he went. Well, Scripture tells us he was in this wilderness in a town called Ephraim, staying with his disciples. And so it says, John chapter 12, verse 1, six days before the Passover. So again, if you like the timeline... Next week is Palm Sunday, right? Next Sunday is the day we, we call Palm Sunday. It's the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. Now remember, in Jesus' day, the Sabbath was on Saturday. So I don't know where along the way, but we now do church on Sunday. But in Jesus' day, all that happened on Saturday. So six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore went to Bethany. So this is the Sabbath day. This is Saturday. This is this coming Saturday. The, guy, the time that the kids are having the lock-in, this is when this happened. Okay? So he went back to Bethany on the Sabbath, maybe right before the Sabbath. He's at Lazarus' house with Mary and Martha, and they're having a feast. Okay? The very next day, he's going to enter Jerusalem, which is next Sunday, Palm Sunday. 
and what Jacob's going to talk about next week. So the story we're talking about right now happens the day before the triumphal entry. So Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. He spent some time in the wilderness. He's teaching his disciples. He's giving them all these last words. We know later on in the book of John, John says, man, if we could even write down everything Jesus taught us, there would not be enough books in the world. I mean, he, Jesus knew his time was over. He knew within a two-week, three-week period he's going to pass away. So he is like, you know, it's like cram session. Those of you who went to college and like you had those cramming nights for your finals, right? You stayed up all night. You drank lots of coffee, lots of Mountain Dew, lots of whatever you drank to stay awake. And you just crammed and crammed and crammed. That's kind of what Jesus is doing with his disciples. He's just giving them all these teachings, all these last second things. And so now he comes to Bethany. So everyone, everyone's in Jerusalem going, is he going to show up? Is he not going to show up? They know there's an order out to arrest him. They know there's an order out to try to kill him. The Pharisees are offering money for his head. Everyone's like, what's he going to do? Is he really the Messiah? Is he really the revolutionary? Is he going to show up? Is he going to overthrow Rome? Is he going to overthrow the Pharisees? Do you think he'll show up? I mean, he raised a lot. I mean, that just, that's the, the buzz of the town. So I'm talking really fast and saying all these things to give you the, uh, just a mental picture of what's going on. So Jesus arrives in Bethany. So six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was who where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave him a dinner. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, as is good old Martha, right? Remember the story of Martha and Mary, and Mary wasn't serving, and Martha was serving, and she's all angry and like, man, aren't you going to make my sister help me? And he's like, but you need to know your seasons and know your times. And they had that little story. Well, as usual, Martha the servant is serving. So Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. And so we know that this was most likely a feast. This wasn't just like a dinner uh, because dinner would have just been called a main meal. Um, I mean, they wouldn't have been had at a table. They wouldn't have been reclining at the table. So for the fact that Martha's serving, they're reclining at the table indicates most likely this was a feast. And so Lazarus and Mary and Martha have invited tons of people into their home, Jesus and the disciples, and there's a party going on. Everyone's getting ready for the week of Passover. There's this buzz. I mean, even the disciples are not quite sure what's going to happen. They know. They told Jesus, why are we even going to the Passover? And a few chapters earlier in John, they said, hey, the, the Jews are trying to kill you. The Pharisees are trying to kill you. We probably shouldn't go. Jesus said, no, it's my time. We got to go. So there's this like buzz everywhere. And so they're having this big feast. And they're, they're essentially honoring Jesus for what he did for Lazarus, giving Lazarus back life. And again, all of that a foreshadow of what's to come. Remember, people are arriving early to purify themselves. So we got people coming early to purify themselves, people looking for Jesus, wondering if he's going to show up. Jesus is in Bethany at a feast, at a party, hanging out with, of course, sinners, which is going to make the religious people mad. Um, and it says, Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. I just want to stop right there. So Mary is, once again, not serving the way Martha was serving. Mary is not serving the food, taking care of the food, but Mary is serving here. Mary does a couple things that, that are just wow in, in culture. So Mary, therefore, is at the meal. She takes a pound of of expensive perfume. We know from, from Matthew and Mark and Luke, and Luke the, other, the other gospels, that the, the perfume was in an alabaster jar. We also know that she anointed his head and his feet from the other texts. Um, and so this, and John focuses on the feet. Well, there's a couple reasons why jo John focuses on the feet. Because the only people that touched feet, because feet are kind of gross, right? I mean, I don't know if anyone here likes feet, but feet are gross. So, I mean, they're in our shoes. They're dirty. The only people that would have touched feet in Jesus' day were the servants. So it didn't matter who you were, Mary and Lazarus and Martha, if they had a house big enough to have a party, they would have had a servant. They would have had a couple servants. And so as custom, when you traveled for the day, when you arrived at someone's home, the first thing that you were given was you sat down and someone washed your feet. So the servant would, and would, would sit you down and wash off your feet because your feet were dirty. Because it's a dusty road and you have sandals on and your feet are filthy. And then they, they would actually give you some oil or perfume, so to speak, to put on your head and like put under your armpits or whatever so that you smelled better. They didn't bathe on a regular basis in Jesus' day. So they'd enter a home, they'd wash their feet, they'd kind of wash their head, they'd wash their face. Hence why the Muslims today, when they go to pray, that's what they do. 
Muslims pray five times a day and they wash their face, they wash their head, they wash their hands, they wash their feet. It's exactly what you did when you entered a home of a Jewish person back in the day. Again, Muhammad listened to all these things and incorporated so much of his false teaching into that. So you would have, you would have had your feet washed, you would have put on some oil, you would have kind of smelled better, and you would have entered the home. Mary, which again, this is a foreshadow for what we're going to do on Monday, Thursday, Mary takes the posture of that servant. She, she, she takes that posture of complete humility, complete servanthood, and begins to clean Jesus' feet. Now, I realize that we don't walk around barefoot yet. Some of you guys will here in the summer. But imagine if you spent a week walking around barefoot. Imagine if you went everywhere barefoot, especially on these gravel roads. Think about how dirty your feet would be. I mean, I, I, I remember doing this in Africa. I mean, obviously everything was dirt roads and just walking from my house to the church, my feet were filthy. And, and when, we, when we did foot washing there, like literally I could just watch the dirt go off my feet. It brought a whole lot more to life than when we all get pedicures right before we do foot washing here in America and then go wash each other's feet. And don't tell me you don't do that because I know people do. Okay, so Mary takes this posture of humility and devotion and she begins to anoint his head first and then wash his feet. Now on top of that, she uses her hair to wipe down the feet. And in Jewish culture, and Jewish custom, a woman would never let her hair down in public. Okay, the, the hair would have stayed up in a bun. Similar to a lot of our, our Mennonite brothers and sister, or sisters in the past that would have come with a head covering on, their hair would have always been in a bun. Your hair did not come down in public. Because hair was considered beautiful. Hair was considered a part of the beauty of a woman. And so that was saved for the husband and the husband alone. No one saw the hair. No one saw how flowing it was, how beautiful it was. That was kept for the home to, of an intimacy thing with husband and wife. Okay? So she lets her hair down and she uses her hair to wipe off his feet. Now this wasn't a sexual thing. It wasn't an intimacy thing. But it showed the companionship of this group. It showed that Mary and Martha and Lazarus and all the other women that would have been there that traveled with Jesus that we know about that were at the cross and his disciples, like this was a tight family. They were close. They had done life together. We forget about that, but for the three years that Jesus traveled, these people traveled with him. These women, we, we talk about the two Marys, Mary Magdalene and Mary and Martha and Mary, his, 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 uh, his mother and a few other women. They traveled with Jesus. They provided his meals and the disciples traveled with him. This group had become tight. They were a family. For the last three years, they had been doing life and ministry together. And so this wasn't like a, a sexual thing at all, although people have, have tried to say that it is and that Mary and Jesus had a baby and were married. That's not at all true. It's showing the humility and her devotion to him and the intimacy that this group had. This group was essentially acting like the church before there was even a church. And she took down her hair and she washed off his feet. So, again, um, you got a pound of nard, an expensive perfume. And for those of you who like to know how much things were, what it cost, there, we go on in this next part. He says, But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to keep himself to what was put into it. So Mary has anointed Jesus. She's wiped his feet. The whole house smells beautiful. And then we see the sin that's in the room, right? Judas, in all of his pomp, and all of his religious greatness, he's like, what a waste. You just let her pour perfume on your body? I mean, we could have sold that perfume to the poor. 300 denarii we could have given to the poor. I mean, he looked good. He looked awesome as he walked around with his chest pumped out going, what a waste. How can you let her do this? Why would you let that woman do this thing, Jesus? What were you thinking? Don't you care about the poor? Man, we've all kind of been there, right? We've all been the Judas at times where we kind of make an excuse for something that doesn't make sense and we try to justify it with scriptures or, we're, or it just doesn't make sense. And yet John lets us know Judas could care less about the poor. He was a thief. He wanted the money. If 300 denarii went into the bag, he was taking a cut. 
He was keeping some for himself. He could care less about the poor. He could care less about the perfume. He could care less about Mary and her devotion because he had already made up his mind Jesus was not who he said he was. Jesus wasn't this Messiah. He wasn't going to overthrow Rome. He wasn't going to overthrow the Pharisee leaders. We need to wait for the next revolutionary, the next Messiah, because this guy is not it. Judas was looking for a Savior and a Messiah in all the worldly ways and missed out on the spiritual ways. So he wants to steal the money. He could care less what Mary was doing. And John reminds us of that. He was a thief, and he stole the money. He kept some for himself. But like I said, when I, when I read that, that, those couple of verses, man, that hit me to the core. Because I thought about in my own life at different times where I've said something righteous or, or arrogant in that way that honestly I was saying to cover up stuff that was going on in my life. You know, I wanted to look good in front of people. I wanted to look good. I wanted to look like the right Christian or the right pastor. But there was just an ugliness inside of me. And I was just trying to cover it up with something that just sounded spiritual. And that's exactly what Judas does here. And I think if we're honest, we've all been there right? We've all said something spiritual to cover up the ugliness that's going on in our lives or the things that we're battling with. Again, I'm just being honest. Like, that hit me to the core because I'm like, oh, wow, I, I've done that. I've, I've been that guy. I've been in that place. Now, thankfully, I, I, I've had the humility to humble and admit it and ask for forgiveness and not continue to run down that path like Judas did, but I've been there. I've tried to cover up my own ugliness with a righteous talk. So if you're wondering how much 300 denarii is, if you basically, it was a year's wages, so if you, just, just a rough number, if you take the minimum wage and you multiply it by 40 hours a week and you multiply it by however many, in 300 days roughly that you work in a, in a year, roughly today that would be about $36,000. So now you see why Judas was like, whoa, that's a lot of money. $36,000 was being poured out on the head and the feet. Now granted, it wasn't because it was 300 denarii, but that's the equivalent, right? This gift that Mary gave for Jesus, this gift of devotion, this gift of preparing the sacrifice, preparing, purifying the sacrifice that's about to come, even though she doesn't even fully know that yet, is being poured out on the floor. $36,000, just, just wasted, gone. When you start talking about money in those figures, it gets everyone's attention. I, I don't know if I could give away $36,000. I, I don't know if I could waste that. That's a lot of money. We could, we could do a lot of good things with that. I mean, that, that, wow, that's a sacrifice. So again, we, we understand, at least I understand where, where Judas was coming from. His answer wasn't necessarily wrong. His, his motive behind it was wrong. And Jesus rebukes Judas, right? The king of kings, the, the king that has a, a, a cattle on a thousand hills, money's not an issue to him. He could care less about that. Verse 6, he says, or verse 7, sorry, Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. Right? Jesus, Jesus just quickly just shuts Judas down. He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, you don't, you don't get it. She's preparing me. She's preparing me. I'm, I'm, she's purifying the sacrifice. The same way that the Pharisees had to purify everyone. The Pharisees had to go in and prepare the sacrifices for the Passover. They had to prepare the rams and the cattle and the turtle doves and all the things that were going to go on. That's exactly what Mary is doing in this picture of Jesus. She's purifying the sacrifice that in six days is going to be on the cross, dying for the sins of mankind. She's preparing the sacrificial lamb. She doesn't, I don't know that she knew she was doing that. She was just anointing her leader, her God, the, her Messiah. She loved him. She was devoted to him. He had changed her life. She'd given him, she had, he had given her back her brother. She knew that this was the one, and she just wanted to say that. But in the, in the same sense, she was preparing the sacrifice. She was preparing the lamb to be slaughtered. And Jesus quickly rebukes Jesus. He said, leave her alone. In fact, what she hasn't used, she's going to keep for my burial. And we know, again, as you read the story, and we'll look out on Easter, that Mary... And Mary Magdalene and Martha and all these other women, they ran to the tomb that morning to finish preparing the body, using these perfumes on the body. And obviously they found the grave empty. There was no body there. And Jesus reminds him, he says, look, the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. He said, the poor are not going anywhere. There will always be poor in the world and you'll always have to make decisions on how to serve the poor. Jesus isn't saying don't give to the poor. 
No, by no means. He's simply reminding us that there will always be poor people among us. And as the church, as Christians, we're supposed to serve the poor. We're supposed to take care of the poor. And that was one of the commands that Christ and is all throughout scriptures he gives to us. And he's saying they will always be there. You'll always have to make tough calls. You'll always have to decide how you're going to serve the poor. But in this situation, you will not always have me. Enjoy these last moments with me. Hear my words. Enjoy this time because I'm going away. You will no longer be able to see me face to face. We can no longer talk face to face. We can't, we can't eat together. We can't laugh together. Now he sends the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. But just imagine that, if you will. Man, how many of us have always sometimes just felt like, man, I just feel like Jesus is never listening. Or God's not there. Or why can't I hear his voice? I mean, these guys got to eat with Jesus, laugh with Jesus, cry with Jesus, talk with Jesus, ask Jesus questions, just see him face to face. It would be absolutely amazing. And Jesus is like, dude, treasure what you have. I'm here with you right now. Treasure these moments. Treasure this time because I'm leaving you. And it's going to get tough. And it's going to get hard. And we, and we see that and we're going to look at that over the next few weeks. Man, a- after the triumphal entry, entry sorry, and, and we have the Monday Thursday and, and the, the Last Supper and, and washing the feet. And then what does he talk about? He says, I'm the way, the truth, and life. He promises the Holy Spirit. He says he's the true vine. He talks that hey, the world's going to hate you. Your joy is going to turn into, or your sorrow is going to turn into joy. I've overcome the world. I mean, he spends those last few hours in the garden. Chapter 15, 16, and 17 are all in the garden of the Gethsemane. He's just saying these things over and over. He's like, I'm leaving, and the world is going to hate you because of me. The world is going to hate the church because of me. The world is going to hate Christians because of me. And it's true. The world does. When we act like Jesus, when we live like Jesus, when we try to be Jesus, people just think we're crazy. We're weird. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. Every day, at least eight believers lose their life for the kingdom. Not in America, but around the world. He's like, you're not always going to have me. Then if you flip the page, I just want to say one thing about these, la- these last two verses, and then we'll come back to this story. It says, when the large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was there, so they finally figured out where Jesus was, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. And this is exactly the group that Judas fell in line with out of their pride, out of their arrogance, out of their self-righteousness, even though the evidence was right in front of them, they're like, nope, we're just going to get rid of it. Like, can you believe this guy? He's ruining everything. He's not here to overthrow Rome. He's not the Messiah we're looking for. He's telling us we got to not hold on to our money. We got we to gotta take care of the poor. He's ruining everything we've set up. We've worked for decades and decades to set up this perfect church and to be righteous and holy and look good. And he's thrown it upside down in three simple years. We've got to get rid of this guy. That was the message of the Pharisees. They couldn't stand what he was saying because he was dagging them in the heart over and over and over. He was pointing out their flaws. And instead of repenting and going, Lord, we're sorry. We're sorry. They're like, we got to get rid of the truth. We got to get rid of the evidence. So as long as killing Jesus, we got to kill this guy. Because who can deny a dead guy walking around alive? As long as Lazarus is alive, as long as Lazarus is promoting the gospel, as long as Lazarus is speaking, it proves we're wrong. So we got to get rid of him. So not only did they plot to kill Jesus, they plot to kill Lazarus simply because people were believing in Jesus, worshiping the truth, instead of worshiping the institution worshiping the rules, worshiping the law, and the Jews couldn't handle it. The Pharisees couldn't handle it. So what do we do when we don't like the truth? Well, we get rid of the truth. (laughs) Nothing's new under the sun. I don't think that's changed much today in our world that we live in. So that's the story. That's the scene as we head into this last week, as we head into this last few days before Easter. We've got Mary washing the feet of Jesus, preparing the sacrifice, preparing the the lamb that is to be slain. And we see Jesus do the exact same thing. And I encourage you guys, man, to come on Monday, Thursday. If you've never come before, it's such a special time. April 1st, Thursday, 6 o'clock. 
That's exactly what we do. We, 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 in a way, reenact this. We get together. We have a simple supper like Jesus would have had. It's not a feast. We wash each other's feet. We participate in communion. The same way that Jesus sat down in that meal and he washed all the disciples' feet, including Judas. In this situation, he rebukes Judas. But at that last supper, at that last meal, Jesus sat down and he washed the enemy's feet. He loved on the enemy to the very last. He loved on Judas to the last possible second. He washed his feet. He served him. He served him communion even. And then he said, go do what you got to do. Because he knew Judas wasn't going to change. Judas was like these Pharisees in 9 and 10. Jesus wasn't who he said he was, wasn't going to be. They weren't going to have riches. They weren't going to be in power. They weren't going to be a world power again. He wasn't going to overthrow Rome. It wasn't going to be like in the days of David and Solomon when silver was a common currency. It's all a lie. He's nothing he said he was going to be. He's tricked us. We've got to get rid of him, and we've got to get rid of all truth that points to him. That's the camp that Judas was in because what Judas and what the Pharisees and the law, teachers of the law never understood, it was never about the world. It was about heaven. It was about eternity. It was a heart issue. It's always been about a heart issue. Even all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, when God comes to Cain and he knows Cain's going to kill his brother and he tries to plead with Cain not to do it, God said, man, your heart is betraying you. Turn to me. It's been a heart issue from the day one. It's never been a head issue. It's always been a heart issue. And that's what Judas didn't understand. So a couple, just four, four things that I wrote down from this passage. Just things that challenged me, things, questions I needed to ask myself. And I just want to share them with you as, as a way to close this sermon. It's not super complicated, it's just simple stuff. The first thing I wrote down is, do I understand the season and time God has me in? Let me repeat that for people that like to take notes. Do I understand the season and time God has me in? Lazarus, Mary, Martha understood their season was something unique. And Mary took that posture of humility and servanthood and began to serve the master, began to serve Jesus. Judas didn't get it. He didn't understand the season. He was angry. He was frustrated. Jesus wasn't what he expected. He wasn't what he had pre-thought about. He was wasting money. He was wasting time. Judas had a wicked heart. So I, do I understand the season and time God has me in? Jesus understood it. Even though the disciples begged him not to go back, he went back to Bethany. He spends the Sabbath with his family. The next day he's going to enter Jerusalem and begin the last week of ministry, knowing that it's leading to the cross, knowing that he's going to lose his life, but he knew that's exactly where God wanted him. Am I willing? The second thing I wrote down is, am I willing to serve people with humility and devotion? Mary, in front of everyone, anointing Jesus, wiping his feet, spending an enormous amount of money on a special perfume to purify the lamb, to even use her hair, that devotion, that humility. Am I willing to serve people with humility and devotion? Am I willing to be Mary? Am I willing to put myself out there even when it doesn't make sense? Even when people are going to make fun of me? Even people are like, dude, Mike's crazy. He's lost his mind. Am I willing to put myself out there because of my humility and devotion not to serve people but to serve Jesus? That was another question I asked myself. I mean, and am I, being, am I willing to be sacrificial in my giving? I mean, when you, when you think of how much money this was in, you, in common day terms, the amount of sacrifice that Mary took in buying this perfume and anointing, that's sacrificial giving. Am I willing to give sacrificially? Am I willing to give so it hurts? Or am I only willing just to give enough and make sure that it never hurts me? Because we can't take it with us, right? You can't, I mean, you can easily spend it all. <laughs> You can't take it with you. Am I willing to give sacrificially? Do I trust that my God will continue to provide for me even when he tells me to do something that doesn't make sense economically and yet I'm going to give sacrificially and even though, okay, God, this makes no sense economically, but I know you're telling me to do it, so I'm going to do it because he'll continue to provide. The more we give sacrificially in our own lives and in our church, I believe God will continue to bless us. 
because we've proven that we'll be responsible with that. So are we willing to give sacrificially? Am I willing to give sacrificially even when it doesn't necessarily make sense economically? And the last question that I wrestled with is, like Judas, do I make excuses to cover up my sin with my righteous acts? I'm going to be honest. Man, I'm probably most guilty of that. Man, I, the things that I battle with, the sin that I struggle with, the things that wrestle inside of me, and just trying to cover that up with righteous devotion and righteous acts, instead of sometimes just going to my brothers, my accountability partners, and saying, man, I need prayer. I need help. I'm struggling. And no matter how much I pray or how much I read a devotion, it's not going to cover up with what's going on in my heart. I just need people in my life. So like Judas making excuses and trying to cover up for his own sin, do I do the same thing? And the reality is I do. If you're looking for a perfect pastor, you hired the wrong guy. I'm not. I struggle. I'm sinful. And so too many times, like Judas, I try to cover it up with righteous acts to make myself feel better, to look better, to look good, even though I know the battle that's dwelling inside of me. So those are the four things that challenge me in these simple verses. Do I understand the season and time God has me in? Am I willing to serve people with humility and devotion? Am I willing to be sacrificial in my giving? And am I willing to be transparent and not make excuses to cover my sin with my righteous acts? Not a super complex message, not a super deep message, especially given what we talked about last week but just some simple things that I saw as we prepare to head into the triumphal entry, as we head into Palm Sunday, as we head into Jesus' last week, as we head into Monday, Thursday, and eventually Resurrection Sunday. Because everything, everything depends, not just on that cross, but on that empty tomb. Everything God did, everything God said, depends on him first going to the cross to die, but more importantly, that grave being empty. Because in that empty grave, he proved he was who he said he was. And no amount of mental knowledge will that, will that ever make sense. Because it's a thing we have to believe and we take on by faith. And it becomes that heart issue. Knowing that Jesus was who he said he was. And he asked us to live a certain way. He modeled us to live a certain way. And are we willing to do that? Or are we going to keep justifying our actions like Judas did? So that's what I want to leave you with this morning. To end our morning, yesterday we had a day of prayer. I don't know how many people ended up signing up. I didn't get to see that. 